Hello, everybody, and welcome to Where Are They Now in Sports. This is brought to you by Malibu Clothes. Get your suits right here at the Malibu Clothes Building in Beverly Hills. And if you're not in the area, all you have to do is go to www.malibuclothesbh.com. Today's guest is a former Major League Baseball player. Us New Yorkers love him. He had a great career with the Yankees, and he played with other teams. Please welcome the King, Jim Larritz. How are you? What's that? How are we doing, Ed? How are you doing? Great, great. So before we talk about what are you doing now, Jim, let's talk about your journey. You went to University of Kentucky. Why'd you pick that school? Well, actually, I went to a junior college in Georgia for two years first. Uh, when I came out of high school, I was supposed to be a number one draft pick for the Atlanta Braves, which was kind of ironic. That was a team that I always beat. Um, but I broke my leg two days before the draft. And the scout came to my dad and said, listen, we have, we have a nice junior college in Georgia. He can go there. If he's healthy, we can draft him either the next year or the year after. Unfortunately, they wanted me as a catcher, and I couldn't squat down uh, on my foot the first two years, so I had to learn to play the outfield and third base. Then I didn't get drafted either one of those two years. I had good years there, and good enough that I had a couple scholarships to a couple four-year schools, and I would I was talking to a few scouts, and I felt like after my junior year I would get drafted, so I chose Kentucky so I could be home near my parents because Cincinnati was only an hour away. So I went I went to play in Kentucky. <clears throat> Of course, had another good year there, but didn't get drafted. Again, was not catching yet. I was still playing third base in the outfield. Um, I went out and played in a summer league in Kansas, which ironically is the same league that Albert Pujols played in. And we, we both lived with the same host family, so that was kind of a, a tie that him and I have. But I went out to play in Hayes, Kansas for the summer. I told the coach, listen, I want to go back to catching. I went back behind the plate within a week. The Yankees saw me catching. They came to me and said, listen, you know, would you be interested in signing now? And I said, of course. And uh, I signed two days before school started my senior year and reported to spring training in 1986. So how much did they sign you for being a free agent? It was $8,000. And uh, it was $8,000 and a trip to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. You get to Baltimore. What's it like? coming into the clubhouse. I know it's not Yankee Stadium, but still, yeah. you get to the clubhouse. What's what's the feeling like when you come in and you see the equipment manager telling you, or whoever tells you, there's your locker, and you got Mattingly there. I mean, I don't know if he played that yet. I know he got hurt, but Jesse Barfield. First time, Alan and I, we, we, you know, we, we took the plane in. We got in right around 4 o'clock, so we knew we weren't going to get there for batting practice. So we, we got in there. The team was out taking BP. We walk into the locker room. It's just him and I, and it's just like you look at the names. And like you said, Barfield, Mattingly, you know, Andy Hawkins, uh, Dave LaPointe, Steve Sachs. Now, I knew some of these guys from the big league camp, so I was somewhat familiar with a couple of them. I think the score, I think it was 2-1. to one. Uh, We were losing, and they showed Greg Olson in the bullpen warming up, and they showed his stats. You know, 13 out of 13 straight saves, hasn't blown one all season. Uh, so I'm like, listen, I'm not getting in this game. Right. And still getting loose. I walk out about the seventh inning, eighth inning, and uh, all of a sudden Wayne Tollison's on deck and Steve Sachs gets on base on an error. And all of a sudden Stem says, Larry, you're hitting. Ooh. So I'm like, okay. And I, I, I go up to hit and uh, – Sure enough, the uh, the first pitch. Now, Greg Olson, if you remember, had a nasty curveball. That was his out pitch. And I had never seen it before. I had first time facing him. First pitch he throws me bounces about 52 feet in front of you know home plate. I'm swinging at it because I'm so excited. It gets by uh, Mickey Tendleton at the time, and uh, Steve Sachs goes to second base. So now we're still losing 2-1. to one. Steve Sachs is on second. And uh, next pitch, he throws me another curveball in the dirt. I swing at it and miss. I'm down 0-2. Third one, he throws me as a fastball. He waist up and away. I take it for ball one. Then he comes back with another curveball. And I just stayed with it enough to hit a line drive down first base. Just foul. Mike Ferraro, who was our first base coach, mm -hmm. I almost hit him. And uh, But then it, it gave me a little confidence. Like, okay, you know what? Stay on, you know, stay on it. And sure enough, he tried to come back with the same pitch again, and he hung it. I got a base hit right through short and third. Uh, and as uh, Steve Sachs came home to score the tying run, 
I was on first base and Randy Milligan was the first baseman. And he looked at me and he said, pretty impressive kid. And he gets the ball for me, got the ball and he, he threw me the ball. And that was my, uh, that was, you know, that was my first time, first big league at bat, first big league hit, first RBI yeah. and Greg Olson's first, uh, blown save of the year. So yeah, pretty no. cool beginning. Yeah. Now, you know, you played with Don Mattingly through the days when the Yankees were struggling, but you were climb. you know, every year you guys were climbing up. What did you learn from Don Mattingly? Well, the first thing I learned was, you know, the excitement of my first day in Yankee Stadium, mm -hmm. walking into that locker room and seeing that my locker was next to Don Mattingly. Wow. You know, it was it was amazing. One thing that over the next couple of years I would learn about Don Mattingly is that this guy was the number one team player of any player that I ever played with my entire career. Even though I was the kid taking his spot when he wasn't playing first, mm -hmm. he was out there every day trying to show me what could help us get an advantage, how we could help the team win. And it was just amazing to me that this superstar, this guy that I had on the pedestal, treated me, like I said, a young kid that could possibly take his job, mm -hmm. has, listen, listen, whatever it takes for us to win that day, we'll do. In 95, Mattingly announces this is his final year, Jim. You guys get to October. What was it like? as a teammate in the clubhouse, were all you guys saying, guys, let's do it for Mattingly, man. Let's do it for this guy. Well, yeah, I'm almost to a fault. Almost to a point where I think some of the guys on the team felt like, hey, wait a minute, you know, we want to win this thing too. Mm -hmm. At the time, though, Donnie was, you know, you knew Donnie was probably going to be done. Uh, you know, it was just, you could, for the players that saw him, you could see what he had to go through every day just to get on the field. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, people didn't see it at 10 o'clock in the morning on the road. He's in the pool doing exercises. Uh, you knew this was going to be it. And Buck Showalter, to his credit, you know, told everybody, we're doing this for Don Mattingly. And it was, the irony of that was Buck Showalter was the reason Don, or he never, I'm sorry, Don Mattingly was the reason Buck Showalter was never in the big leagues. Because Buck was the first baseman in the minor leagues for the Yankees who hit 350 every year but was not going to replace Don Mattingly. Wow. And Buck couldn't play any other position. So, you know, for Buck to be that big of a man and say, hey, listen, we're doing this for Donnie, it was pretty special. Game one, you guys won. So you got yeah. Now, game two, here it is, the 15th inning. <laughs> you were 0 for 5 the whole game, you know, going to your sixth at bat that year. I mean, that game. Yeah, and yeah. next thing you know, Belcher threw that fastball, like, middle away. Tell me about about that at bat. Well, you know, Eddie, we always talk about the funny stories that go behind the story. Yes, that's what I um, want. <laughs> you know, the twelfth inning, I got up with Don Mattingly on second base uh -huh. and a three-one count off off Belcher at the time, and he threw me a hanging pitch, and I hit a ground ball back to him for the third out and the inning. I had a chance, to, you know, to, to to win the game then, or I'm sorry, it was a second out. I came back in the locker room or came back in the, in the, in the runway with my bat. I was so upset that I just started breaking the bat in the tunnel and David Cones was walking down the tunnel. And after I get done and I'm just, you know, I'm just cracking everything. And all of a sudden he looks at me, he goes, dude, that was impressive. He said, you've caught 12 innings and you still have that kind of energy. So he totally broke the ice, you know, <laughs> as far as me being really mad. And then I remember Ruben Sierra grabbing me and going, hey, you're going to get another chance. Don't worry. You're going to get another chance. And uh, sure enough, you know, we get to the 15th inning. Pat Kelly gets a walk in front of me. Uh, Belcher gets behind 3-1, has to throw a strike. And uh, I was able to hit the, the opposite field home run just over the outstretched glove of Jay Buhner. And the funniest thing about the story is Buck Showalter had looked at me before I went up on the on deck circle. And he said, Jimmy, you've caught 15 innings. You're done. Stanley's coming in next. Make this a back count. Oof. So I hit the home run. I get done after all the celebrating. Buck looks at me and I go, I, did I make it count? And, you know, we had a little laugh together. So pretty special moment. Yeah, absolutely. So you guys fly to Seattle, and then it was heartbreaking the way it ended. Ugh. It hurt. What did Buck Showalter, what, what did Steinbrenner, what did the guys say after the game in the Seattle visiting clubhouse? Like, what, what was the speech? Well, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, right next to our locker room was the Wise Lounge. And you could hear – the sobs coming from the wise lines, the, the women crying, you know, everybody, everybody you know, upset. 
and in our locker room, we were like, wow, that was just one of the greatest series to be played. We didn't feel like we gave it away. We felt like they, they beat us. It had been one thing if we had a Bill Buckner situation where there was an error mm -hmm. or there was something that we gave away. But we truly felt like, you know what? Wow, that was a great series. There were some great games. It was the year after the strike, so it kind of brought baseball back a little bit. And you know what? We weren't really – we were upset, but we weren't really, like, you know, that down about it until I think everybody saw their wife and went, oh, wow, okay, this is pretty heartbreaking for, you know, for everybody else. Beginning of 1996 season, when you guys came into spring training that year, was it strong? Were you guys like, yeah, this is the team? One of the great things about that 96 team that will never, ever be duplicated – besides Joe Torre, besides Derek Jeter, is how those teams, you know, the Daryl Strawberries, the Doc Goodens, you know, the Jim Lairitzes, the, the, the stories from that team from that year uh, is what really got the fans of New York behind us. Oh, yeah. And, and, and nobody was a superstar. No. Nobody, nobody knew what was going to develop over the next four years. Right. And it was just one of those things that it was, you know, it was like we went from lovable losers to lovable winners. Yeah. And, you know, I, I was funny. I just, and I, and I don't mean to flash back, but just, I was just in Arizona and I saw the Texas Rangers and I saw Tony, well, Fernandez. Tony Fernandez. Right. And I looked at Tony and I said, Tony, does anybody ever come up to you and like, thank you for the New York Yankees? And he, he's like, what are you talking about? I said, because if you don't break your arm, there is no Derek Jeter. Exactly. That's what I always yeah. tell people that. I always tell you. I always tell Yankee fans, you got to thank Tony Fernandez yeah. because if he didn't get hurt, maybe Jeter would not. He would not yeah. start opening day. He I mean, would this not. Is, this is what I tell you, Eddie. Yeah. Bottom line is Derek Jeter gets sent back down to AAA. Mm -hmm. Who knows his mindset? Who knows if he's going to be mad about going back down there? Right. Who knows if he's going to go? You know, who knows if he ever recovers from it? With Joe Torre that year, I mean, he lost his brother mid July. Yeah, Rocco. So, yeah. Yeah. Ro so that was like devastating to come to New York. It's so hard to play. And man, the expectations are high as hell. So it's like, how did he overcome that and say, hey, guys, don't worry about my brother? Yes, I lost him, but just play baseball. Is that, I mean, how do you. What did, he, what well, did he learn from that? One of the things Joe Torre did smart, and I think this time around, is he surrounded himself with coaches that right. were high quality. Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody's better than Don Zimmer. No, no. On the, you know, sitting next to you under the bench. If you need anything about baseball, you got 70 years of experience sitting right oh, yeah. next to you. I mean, that combination of Joe Torre and Don Zimmer, you know, Eddie, I've been around the game for you know, since I was a kid with the Reds. I have never seen a better combination of two coaches that – Knew how to Joe Torrey, who knew how to work people, and 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 really get the most out of people, mm -hmm. and Don Zimmer, who knew the game. One of the things that we knew throughout '96 is when Joe Torrey came into the locker room to speak, there was a major problem. There was something wrong, and Joe had a great combination of coaches and a great combination of veteran players like Paul O'Neill, like myself, like David Cohn, that. You know what? We we were the the senior kid guys on the team mm -hmm. that he could trust. That if something in the locker room wasn't right, we would try to fix it. If if we couldn't do it, then we would have to go to Joe and say, "You're going to have to step up and re and really make that point." And I think really that's where the, what we talk about the chemistry right. of the team was so great from the top of the line all the way down to the last player on the team. You get to the World Series. The first two games, you guys got. You know, the first game you got blown out, Smoltz. You're facing yeah. the best pitching staff. This is so nasty. I'm like, huh? How are they going to win? <laughs> I, listen, I'm a diehard Yankee fan. I was doubting. I'll be honest. Uh -huh. I was doubting. I was like, mm, these guys just won the World Series last year, and now they're going to play against the Yankees. So yeah. the first two games you lose. Was Steinbrenner or any of you guys in the clubhouse doubting like, oh, man, we, we, we might – we might get swept, or we we're gonna lose this series. Be honest. Well, I, and yes, I mean honestly, it was like we we were we were hoping not to get swept. Right. Um, the one thing that I will say though that Joe Torre, you know, you hear all the funny stories, and oh, I told George we went four in a row, and right, right. you know, it, it 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 starts out as a joke. What he did say on the plane, and he made a very good point. He said, "Guys, we play terrible. We can play with these guys, but." In order for us to win this, we got to get this series back to New York. If we can get back to New York, 
we can win this thing. Because even though the Braves beat us those two games, they hated playing in that stadium. Yeah, they, yeah. they were scared. They, I, I, I Trust me, I miss the old stadium because in the new stadium, teams aren't afraid to come in and play. The old stadium, oh, yeah. people people were scared to go play there. Mm-hmm. Game three, David Cohn goes out and wins. Perini hits the home run to give us a little cushion. Uh, you know, and you have the Joe Torre moment with David Cohn on the mound and David saying, let me get that out. And yeah, sure enough, yeah. he gets it. Uh-huh. Um, that was a special moment. We win that game. We were like, okay, now – we still could get beat the next two and not get back to New York. Right. So game four became pivotal. Oh my God. I mean, and you know, if you, and I was a guy that I always read the papers. I was one of those guys that say, I would never tell you that. Oh, I never read a newspaper. You know, I read the papers. Everybody said, how can Joe Torrey start Kenny Rogers? Right. You know, right. this could be it. This is, this is going to be it, you know? And sure enough, the first couple innings, Oh my you know, God. Okay, now yeah. you, you didn't start that game. You guys were losing 6 no. nothing. okay? Yep. In the dugout, Tino got benched, O'Neal got benched. You had lefties on the bench because who? it was Nagel, right? Danny Nagel started, Nagel yep. started. Okay, so now, any doubts right there in the clubhouse, like, I mean, in the dugout, like, ooh, oh, my God. Well, you know, in, in, when you start a game, you don't think about that. But right. then all of a sudden, yeah, you go down 5 nothing, and you're thinking, Wow. And I remember the first two innings of the game, I, my usual routine was to sit in the, in the clubhouse and watch the game, try to pick up what the, if the pitcher was tipping pitches or try to get an idea of you know, what, what, what the pitchers, our pitchers were doing good and their pitchers weren't doing. I remember looking at Pat Kelly going, man, at least we didn't get swept. At least, you know, at least we didn't get swept. And we all kind of felt like that. And then all of a sudden, you know, as Joe Torrey said, come on, guys, let's just chip away. We started to chip away. We got it to six to three. And then all of a sudden you see Paul O'Neill and Tina Martinez pinch hit against Balecki. And you're thinking, all right, we this is a good, great matchup. Mm-hmm. And then Balecki blows those two guys away. Yeah. And I can tell you the feeling in the dugout of we got a chance to, that's it. That was what we felt like. It was that we that was our chance to do it, and now we can't. Because now we see Mark Wollers warming up in the bullpen, who is the best in the game. Oh yeah. You know, before Mariano Rivera was Mariano Rivera, exactly. this was this was their you know their their Mariano Rivera. You know, all of a sudden you see him warming up, and you realize Bobby Cox is going for the jugular. Uh-huh. And uh, you know, and I, I of course I went in the game in the bottom of the seventh inning to catch, and I come up in the top of the eighth, and you know uh, Charlie Hayes starts off with the ground ball that you know, that the, the was pace. the destiny written the momentum changer yes. right there because what is the odds of that Jim being a oh. fair ball? Well, and you think about all that. He he gets that hit. All right, Daryl Strawberry hits an opposite field single. One with the pitch, yeah. Uh, yeah, one with the pitch, and then Mariano Duncan hits a routine double play ball. Taylor made to to Rafael Belliard, who just came in the game for Funny. defense. Yeah. And they don't turn a double play, and it sets the stage, of course, for my home run uh, that was able to tie the game up. And, you know, it was – it was. Um, All right, so was... here's, here's the question before the home run. Why did you ask Daryl Strawberry you want to use one of his bats? What you know, were you know, your bats, man? Well, I had two bats left, uh-huh. okay? I had broke one the night before, uh, pinch hitting. And so I had two bats left. I was facing John Smoltz the next day because Pettit was pitching. Right. And so I was like, listen, you know, Smoltz is going to, he broke one of my bats in game one. You know, I, I need this extra one. Uh, and so Daryl had a brand new set of 12 Mizuno bats right down there by the side of the dugout. And when I, you know, when I knew I was going to face Wollers, who all I knew was he threw 100 miles an hour, I, would, I didn't want to break one of my bats. So I said, to, I said to Straw, can I use one of those? And he's like, yeah, go ahead. So I took a brand new one out of the bag, put a little pine tar on it. And I went up to hit against Wollers. And as I went up to the on-deck circle, I looked back at Don Zimmer and I said, Zim, what's this guy got? He goes, Jimmy, he throws 100 miles an hour. Just get it ready. And so I went up to bat against Wollers. I didn't know his pitches. I just knew about 100 miles an hour. Right. So he throws me the first pitch. I followed straight back. You know, I, I was at a point where I was just going to hack. He throws the next two pitches are sliders. So it's the first two times I get to see a slider. Two not very good ones. And then he comes back with another fastball, and I fouled it back again. And that's the one that he says in his interview afterwards, I thought he was right on me. So I decided to go back to the slider. Right. Now, 
the first two two pitch he threw pretty good, mm -hmm. but left it up a little bit, and I was able to just follow it off, little ground ball down by Willie Randolph at third base, and so yeah, as a catcher, my next thought is okay, he got me, he's got me leaning, now he's going to come back with a fastball in, so the way I used to approach the plate was I'm going to take away that pitch because I know I can't hit a 100-mile-an-hour fastball in, so I'm going to take a, like a half a step off the plate. Mm -hmm. So I took a little half a step back so I could dive out now, and sure enough, he throws me a hanging slider, and because of that little step back, I was able to keep my hands back and hit it. Yeah. And uh, playing in Atlanta, you know, once I hit it, I knew it was gone. You know, to me, it looked like it was a pop-up, but then <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, keep going, keep going. And then I was hearing Joe Buck. He goes, well hit at the track, at yep. the wall. We are tied. I'm like, yo! Oh, I can't oh, yeah. this, you know? yeah. We're just going yeah. crazy six up, and I'm like, there's no way. And that's when I knew they're going to win. You guys are going to win tonight. But then guess what? You got smoked tomorrow. And, oh, yeah. oh my God. You caught Pettit. What was the scouting report with advanced scout telling you guys before the game? Because I know they were saying, they were telling Pettit, throw away the whole time. Don't even throw in. Was that true? Well, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because the story behind the story, again, uh -huh. is after I hit the home run, Joe Torrey called me in the office before the media got in there. And he told me I wasn't going to catch Pettit the next day. Okay. And I said, well... Okay, I really don't care. I just hit the biggest home run of my life. Right, you know, right. if that's what you want to do, that's what you want to do. Um, I said, but you know, why? And he said, well, you know, I'm afraid Andy. Andy won't shake you off. He he has too much confidence in you. And he said, you know, you, you didn't go by the game plan the first game. I said, well, it wasn't necessary. We didn't go by the game plan. Andy couldn't throw a strike, and we got behind everybody two and zero. I said, so we had to come in with a pitch. And I said, uh, but that's okay. If that's what you want to do, that's fine. I walked out of the office, and as I walked out, I saw Pettit. I said, hey, good luck tomorrow. He said, yeah, we got to go get him. And I said, nah, no, nah, it's going to be you and Joe. And he was like, what are you talking about? Well, between him, me saying that to him, I believe he went in the office, said something to Joe. Five minutes later, I got called back in before the media got in there. Joe tells me, you know what, listen, you're going to catch tomorrow. Just stay with the you know stay with a better game plan. To this day, Eddie, I don't know if Joe did that on purpose. If right. that was you know, and again, if Joe is as good as Joe is at reading people and getting the most out of them, maybe he felt that's what he had to do with me. But the point obviously was well taken. Um, so sure enough, the next day, Andy and I, you know, we 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 have game five. You know, and all the time people ask me, Jimmy, game four was the best. You know, that's probably your grand. I said, no. I said, me catching game five because of what happened, because I was challenged by Joe Torrey that I, I didn't do this right the first time, get it right the second time, to go out there and pitch the game that Andy Pettit pitched. And he didn't shake me once. Wow. I was so proud of that game and so proud of that him and I made up for the, what we did the first game uh, that to this day, I love the fact that Andy still says that's the greatest game that he was ever involved in. I can tell you, Eddie, you talk about nerves. People always ask me about nerves and, and things like that. And, you know, with John Wetland pitching, um, you know, it, 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 we got Chipper Jones on third base, yeah. uh, you know, it, or I think it was Chipper Jones. On, or, I don't know. Maybe it wasn't Chipper Jones. I don't know who, who was on third base, but, we, uh, we get into a situation where Luis Polonia comes up to pinch hit. Right, right. And we throw him two or three straight fastballs, and he fouls off two of them, and we have him 0-2, and I know John wants to throw the curveball. But I'm like, dude, you're not throwing a curveball with a man on third, the tying run, because as much as you trust me, I don't trust myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? We're not, and, and you're not going to get beat on your second-best pitch. And so I ran out to the mound. After I, after he shook me off, and I ran out and I said, "Hey, remember, we're not getting beat with our. You know you, what happened to Wolers last night? Got beat with the second best pitch. Right. We're not getting beat with that." And then I went behind the plate, and sure enough, we threw five or six more straight fastballs, and Paul O'Neill makes the great catch in right field. And as soon as we done, I run out to the mound. And I go, "That's why we don't throw that second pitch." Yeah, you beat the Braves. You actually like yeah. swept them in their home. <laughs> the yeah. rally. You yeah. won three games in a row. What was it like? Coming back to the Bronx. But you got another enemy that's really a great pitcher, which he will be in the Hall of Fame this year. Greg Maddox. 
What was the game plan? Well, it was a little different than game one. I think game one, we were a little anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we swung at the first pitch a lot. The first thing that Chris Chambliss and them talked about was not swinging at the first pitch. Work the count like we had done all year. Work the count, make them throw some extra pitches, uh, and don't be don't be worried about getting behind in the count, you know, like like we didn't do the, the second game. I came back in 1999 for the, the series parade. There was nothing like the 1996 parade, uh, you know, and, and I really think the cool thing about that 96 celebration was as soon as the game was over, we were all hugging on the mound. Joe Torrey grabbed me and he said, we need to thank the fans. Jimmy, get these guys together and do a lap. Right. And yeah. we did that special lap. And I'm telling you, man, you look at the, you watch the, the videos of it. You yeah, look at, yeah. and, you, and you look at all the different angles that people have filmed it from different. Mm -hmm. And you just see the excitement and the togetherness that that World Series did for that, for us. Oh, yeah. uh, it was, it was pretty special. After the World Series in 96, you guys probably celebrated in the clubhouse for two hours, pouring champagne all over each other. Where'd you guys go afterwards? What time did you well, guys party until? Well, it's funny. We, we partied all night, um, <laughs> almost almost too much. Uh, yeah, the parade wasn't until two days later, and I think right. we fell asleep maybe three hours before the parade and almost missed it. Um, but no, we, we went out afterwards. We uh, It's funny because a, a good friend of mine who owns a restaurant in New York, mm -hmm. uh, I just saw him this last time I was in town. He was the maitre d' at the Plaza Oak Room. And we went to the Plaza Oak Room after the World Series that year to celebrate. And it was the celebration of a lifetime. He he was the maitre d' that day. He said, you know what? I still have the receipt. I kept the receipt. You guys spent $53,000 at the Plaza Hotel. Oh, my God. Yeah, for the celebration. And he said, you know, and it was all on Tina Martinez's dad's card. And he, he said, I, I wow. still have the receipt. And he said... To this day, he said, I can remember being downstairs in the basement, calling up Mr. Trump saying, can we get more Dom Perignon out of the cooler and out of the thing? Because there was a certain amount of restrictions of how much champagne they could take. But we were just going through bottles after bottles. And then I remember hearing a story two days later of Paul O'Neill and Tino uh, having, having the key to the city and going out and... Uh, going ice skating at Rockefeller Center in the middle of the night saying, please open it up for us, and them opening it up and letting those guys skate for, you know, the only people out there skating. So it's pretty cool. Unbelievable. That that I'll tell you, Jim, you had a great career, yeah. even though you, you played against the Yankees in the World Series in 98. Yeah. <laughs> Did yes. you, like, feel bad when you hit a home run against them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I went 0 for 10 that series. Oh, okay. So it, it, that, was, that was always my joke because then I got back in 99 – and my one at bat was a home run. Yeah, I, always, yeah. I told people, well, see, just like Joe Torre, I wasn't supposed to win unless I was in the pinstripes. Right. So, and you know what Bob Costa said? He said, this guy could be, yeah. what do you say? At a, send, him to, send him to a resort in the yeah, spring exactly. and summer. Just make sure he comes back for October. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. You but no, I mean, it was, Eddie, I, I, I got to tell you this story. You may edit this part, but this is the greatest story. So the Yankees sweep us in 98. I'm playing for the Padres. Uh-huh. All right. And in the San Diego Stadium, the locker rooms are right next to each other. And they're not on opposite fields, like, you know, like most stadiums. Mm -hmm. So as I'm walking out, I see all the guys in there. And I, you know, at the time, I had my cowboy hat and everything on. They see me coming out. David Wells grabs me and pulls me in. All right? And so I'm in there with all the guys. They're pouring champagne, the whole thing. Mr. Steinbrenner looks at me and says, hey, you were the king of New York. Are you the king of San Diego? And I said, well, yeah, why? He said, because we need some place to go celebrate. And I looked at him, I go, wait a minute, you just beat my butt four in a row and you want me to find the place for you guys to celebrate? He's like, yeah, why not? So I called up Junior Seau, God rest his soul. I called up Junior who had just opened up a new restaurant in San Diego and said, listen, can you open up the doors and, and let these guys celebrate? And sure enough, he opened up the restaurant, brought some people in and he said, Jimmy, the only thing that I ask is I need a team signed ball. And so I got him a team sign ball. He comped the whole thing for the Yankees. And, uh, you know, it, it was it was kind of strange celebrating with the Yankees that night after I just got beat. So. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, Jim, you had a great career. And 
what are you doing now? That's the main question. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I got a little combination of everything. I moved to California here three and a half years ago to get remarried. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got, I've got all three of my boys out here with me. Um, and, uh, I've been out here for three years. I've been doing some part-time stuff with the angels. Uh, they got, they got me doing some radio stuff this year. I also work for a bat company out of Norwalk, Connecticut called Tucci lumber, which I'm, I'm putting a plug in for them. Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. For, yeah, called Tucci Lumber, who is now one of the bigger suppliers in the major leagues. Uh, it's a, a buddy of mine I played minor league ball with in San Diego when I was on a rehab assignment uh, with the Padres. He started this bad company about five years ago, so I do some part-time work for him uh, with all the teams out here on the West Coast. And it still keeps me around the game, keeps me around the guys, and yet, you know, I'm able to sell something I know a lot about, which is baseball bats. Right. And uh, so th th until I can get my kids growing up, until they get old enough, since I am bringing them up with you know, with, with, with the stepmother, um, and w when they get older, I'll probably get back on the field and hopefully go back to coaching. But as of right now, I'm kind of enjoying this time. This is Derek Jeter's final year. What do you yeah. want to say? Uh, you know, he announced his retirement, that he will retire after this year. You play with the guy. He was a rookie in 96. What did you learn from him and watching him playing every year the past, what is it? This is going to be his 20th year, 19th year? 20th year, yeah. 20th, 20th year. year. Talk to me about what, what What do you want to say to this guy? Well, yeah, Derek, Derek has been one of the greatest examples. I mean, I, I, I always shy away from idols. Mm -hmm. from, from I have three boys myself that all play baseball that all love Derek Jeter. Um, and I, I always told my kids, if, if there's going to be one, I always tell parents, don't ever have your kids idolize players off the field, idolize them on the field for what they do. Cause you just don't know what happens in their personal lives. And you don't ever want a kid to be defeated because of not because of the athlete, but because of what the, the personal circumstances, Derek Jeter is the one guy that I continue to say to this day is someone that I would tell my kids to idolize for everything he has done on and off the field. Here's a guy that for 20 years in the hardest city to play in, in the hardest media capital that looks for every little thing they can do to take you down when you're on that pedestal. And believe me, I know that. Okay. Um, it, it's, it's amazing for what he's done. It's a tribute to his mother and father. Uh, I know both of them very well. They did a tremendous job of keeping him grounded and centered. Uh, and for him to do what he's done, not only on the field, but off the field with his charity, with his turn, his turn two foundation, um, there, there has been no better ambassador to the game than Derek Jeter uh, for what he's done, except for possibly the man that retired last year, Mariano Rivera. Uh, but Derek is he, Mariano was more private, more quiet. Derek has been the front and center, the face of baseball. And I think Bud Selig said it best. There is nobody better that, that has represented the game over the last 20 years on and off the field than Derek Jeter. And, uh, you know, I, I have a standard story that I always tell the kids that really showed who Derek Jeter really was on the field and in practice because. When he got traded, when I got traded in 96, after 96, when Derek was a rookie, I saw his workout routine, 1,000, you know, 500 ground balls, 250 swings in the cages. I used to tell him as a young kid before spring training when we worked out together, slow down, slow down. He was like, I only know one, one way to do it. And I really believe when I came back in 99, after they had won two World Series, after Rookie of the Year, I expected to see a kid a little full of himself. A little bit, hey, you know, I'm Derek Jeter. But when I came back, it reminded me of, and maybe Don Mattingly had this effect on Derek, it reminded me of Don Mattingly. Here was a humble kid mm -hmm. who still took 250 ground balls, still took all the swings, still did what he did the day he came to the big leagues. And that's why he stayed successful. And Eddie, I think that's one of the reasons why people say we're shocked that he maybe he announced it now. I think Derek realizes that he can't do that routine anymore. Right. He right. can't keep up with it. And therefore, it's time for him to retire because he doesn't feel like he can perform to the level that he's used to. Not the fans, but that he's used to. Right. And the workouts that go with that, I think he said, you know what? It's time to move on. And I think he couldn't have picked a better way to do it before the season started, 
If there was a biography about Jim Laritz, which there actor is. would you there hire is. to play you? No, there there is a biography. Well, there's a book. There, there's a book called Catching Heat. One of these days, we're gonna get we're gonna get somebody to do the story on it. But who would play me? Yeah. That's who a would tough... you if you call the shots? Who would you who would you hire? If I called the shots. If Vin Diesel could play baseball, I was thinking about Vin Diesel. <laughs> I was saying to myself, definitely Vin Diesel. Yeah. You know, I, I, if Vin Diesel, or even uh, I would say, if, if Mark Wahlberg would shave his head, then then I think that he could kind of, you know, because he, he's got the body type kind of that I had.